I could leave you with one thought to take away is that we believe the single biggest investor in energy transition is the government and will be for decades. Good morning. So um, actually, I'm here to make some predictions about the future. And, uh, and the future is in some ways unknowable. But when you look carefully through history, you can see shadows of the past and how they're relevant to today. I would say that probably one of the most interesting things that's happening right now is we're, you know, we're making it up and we're inventing an, a whole new industry. We're basically backtracking over the next couple, probably a generation worth of time. We're backtracking 250 years of a carbon-based economy towards something else. And the best example that we've found when we really look in and study that's in a modern day context, it would be the growth of China 2003 to say 2012. And so I'd encourage everyone to kind of look and think about what happened when global steel making capacity doubled. What happened to the miners? What happened to the explorers? What happened to the service providers? What happened to the consumers? And there's a lot of telling things that kind of play out. And you can draw analogies to where we are today in terms of energy transition materials. Can you hear me okay? Yep, okay, great. So uh, very quickly, uh, Pacific Road, um, I've got some slides out on the side, but I'll talk to them for you. So we're a sector specialist. We're, uh, you know, we're, we're mining investors. There are 13 of us based in the United States. In, we're headquartered in Sydney and in the EU. Um, we've run two private equity funds, about a billion dollars Aussie under management. And we invest in public companies and we invest in private companies. Um, if there's a, a change in what we've been doing, we've historically done concentrated investments. And those are investments where we would be top one, two, three, or sometimes the only shareholder in a business. And we would feel that sense of responsibility for outcomes, you know, in what's happening with the business. And those are long duration investments, take a lot of time. And we're looking to transform a business from, say, an explorer to a developer, from a developer to a producer, from a failed company to a successful one. Uh, we also now make liquid investments, and we're running a long short book. Um, I could tell you a little bit more about the investment strategy uh, as we go through that, but those are much shorter duration investments, and we're really looking more at upcoming catalysts or wrinkles. And the reason that we decided to take that on is this is a transition, and it's not linear. It's not to from, right? It's it's going to be push and pull. If you even just look at the experience of uh, say, lithium in 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, 2020, 2021, there's a lot of volatility as capacity comes on and capacity comes off. And I think that you'll find uh, we may be one of the earlier uh, um, uh, sort of reinventions of liquid uh, specialist investors in the mining sector, but there will be more. You know, when we're out raising capital and talking to our capital base, which is predominantly in the United States, the, the most common feedback that we're getting, this is probably relevant to the producers in the industry, is, well, we can't invest in oil and gas anymore, but we believe in energy transition. Uh, and, and how we've been investing you know, hasn't really worked. We want to access energy transition in a different format. I think that's incredibly bullish news for generalist capital being formed in the mining industry over the next three to five years and something that hopefully will help everybody in this room. I just, by the way, uh, uh, so I'll go through this deck. This maybe is gonna take 15 minutes, uh, perhaps a little bit more, and then I'll open up for questions afterwards. Um, if anybody really wants to ask a question, I'll certainly take it. But on structural themes, what we're seeing right now, I mean, look, the supply demand gap is structural, it's generational, and it's brought about by that shift. And I think across the day, and you as producers uh, and participants in the market, really understand that, we see effectively a limitless demand uh, and completely price insensitive demand from, uh, from people who are voters and therefore from politicians for abatement of climate change. And that means an incredibly bullish sentiment for, uh, you know, for energy transition over, over a long period of time. And, uh, and I'll come back to some of the things that have happened that, that have helped reinforce that view. Also, everybody in this room knows that there's really some very clear challenges around, around supply growth. Things that we focus on, well, the project cupboard is bare, you know that. 
and and things are in more difficult positions or require technical advances you know permits the regulators came out of covid too and they're losing their best technical people to minors and so they're understaffed and can't respond uh, but in general people is a huge issue there are not a lot of qualified people that know how to build projects that can build these projects that can permit them in the right way and so when you're looking you know we we, we think and look quite a lot at people both in our concentrated investments and our liquid investments the other thing that that i'll probably spend the most time on is really what are the, what's the impact so fine there's a supply demand gap i get it what's the impact of that and i think that the impact is that there's really new and i'm using new because some of these clues come from the past new business models emerging if i could leave you with one thought to take away is that we believe the single biggest investor in energy transition is the government and will be for decades. And so therefore you as project aspirants or as mining companies need to figure out how am I gonna unlock that box in order to get capital to be successful and how am I gonna compete for all the many shapes and forms of government dollars. Um, finally, you know that, that touches on ESG, we'll talk about that for a little bit. And then the other true belief that we have when we're looking out at the world and underwriting is that we just think that there are higher nominal prices effectively forever. Somewhere between 10 and 15 years, you will start to see automation and ore sorting and efficiency gains and all, and all the rest bring down, you know, increased productivity. But nominal prices, we believe, will be higher forever. And we could talk about that uh, offline. That's not really for today. You know, there's some other things that are going on in the world that you might have noticed. Um, there's a war in Europe, right? There's, uh, there's an energy crisis. Uh, the interest rates are rising. You know, uh, the stock market has had a historic beating um, that is on the order of the global financial crisis over the last quarter. You know, the, uh, so most asset allocators look at those things and they don't, they don't want to take risk in this environment. They're not looking for the next great thing where they can 10 times their money. They're thinking about how do I, how do I not lose my money right now? How can I adjust to what's going on? We know about the later labor shortages. We haven't touched on China in COVID, coming out of COVID. You know, uh, there's still shortages in materials across whether it's chips or supplies. Supply chains aren't normal. And, uh, and you know, everybody is worried about what demand is going to do in 2023, you know, what the war is going to do in 2023, what energy prices are going to be in Europe. Nobody can really make a call on that. If there's one thing that really surprised me this year, um, you know, it has absolutely accelerated. Everybody's come away from all those risks that are out there, all these kind of exogenous, unplannable risks, and said, for whatever reason, that's, that's why we need energy transition. You know, we need to double down. We need to go faster. We need to permit more renewables. We need battery storage in increasing numbers. And you've seen the demand curves, I'm sure a lot of the experts will show you, steepen. You know, the number of gigafactories is doubled in, in what people are trying to deliver between 2027 and say a year ago and 2027 today. So everybody's looking at all these things and they're actually saying, this is why we need to increase ener the speed of energy transition, not wait a minute, this feels really risky, let's back off and, and go at it a different way. So that's a very interesting uh, you know, overlay. So just brief interlude for everybody, there's some good news. Um, you know, we need a lot of new minds, everybody knows that. Uh, Australia is extremely well positioned to deliver everything that the world needs uh, or much of what the world needs. And everybody in this room uh, is, stands to make a lot of money from this because there are just no people left, right? And so the anecdotally, uh, I have friends that have 25 year old sons that are ventilation officers making you know $350,000 a year, right? This is an industry that requires people, it requires decision makers, it requires knowledgeable people that can actually build things, and there just aren't very many left. And so the stresses of the lithium market spill over to aluminum, copper, nickel, gold, right? It's just, it's a, you know, there, there, there just literally aren't enough people and it's gonna impact everything. So, but good news, I think we'll all make some more money out of this. Um, when you step back and you think about, okay, what are the emerging business models? I'll take, uh, I'll take energy trans upstream energy transition materials for a second and talk a little bit about what we're seeing and how we think about ESG. It was interesting, the first part of that last panel as I listened, ESG was risk mitigation, right? Um, and then only at the end of that last panel did, did their viewpoints start to come around to where we see. In our concentrated uh, uh, investments, 
and in our liquid investments, what we're looking for is strategic positioning. And we're looking for companies that are actually providing value to their customers, right? So if you look, all the Japanese steel mills, you know, Korean steel mills started buying joint venture interests in iron ore and coking coal mines in order to secure supply and insulate themselves from price rises. That's going to happen. The upstream and the downstream are going to converge during a time of tight market. So these are your future partners, right? Auto companies, whether through their battery manufacturers, whether it's Ford lending Liontown $300 million, uh, whether it's you know Tesla doing offtake, the, the upstream and downstream are converging right now because everything is so tight. So these are your future partners. And if you look, and, and, and you know, if you're in a position to be doing deals with them, that's great, you're on the right track. If you're not in a position to be doing deals with them, they're actually telling you what they want, okay? What they want is certified ESG, and they use IRMA as a standard, all the automotives you know, are going to it. It's basically, we want an audit on site of your human, you know, your, uh, human rights of your environmental we want to be able to grade and look at you and be able to not worry where is our copper coming from and and it's just you know just if you listen they're telling you what they want and for some reason people are surprised that by that and and I'd like to increase the awareness that to be successful and compete on the field you have to actually understand what game you're playing so I would say in my life, one of the things that's interesting is we're now being directly approached by end users saying, you know, Amazon, uh, where can we get some copper? It's strange to have a technology company call you up and ask for copper offtakes, but that's kind of the dialogue that's happening right now because it's all really tight. And what they want is they want something that is not going to embarrass them corporately uh, at all. So, so that's where ESG isn't risk mitigation. It's actually going on offense and giving people what they need. And so Irma is is interesting because it's a certification from stem to stern. Governments, you know, we talked a little bit about governments. Governments are becoming an increasingly important investor, and there are a number of ways that they're doing it. So we've seen some things that I don't think will continue. The early participants, I can remember I was at the Indo-Pacific Forum in 2019 with a bunch of Aust emerging Australian producers. Most of them have ended up with some type of a government grant because they're smart enough to be in the room. And they were smart enough to be in the room saying, we can help you, policymaker, work on your critical mineral supply chain. Um, some of those have ended up direct customers, like a deal with the DOE or the DOD. And I don't think that that's going to happen very much. I think direct offtake from customers is going to be very difficult because governments in general don't like to pick winners and losers. But if you're a developer, maybe not an explorer, but if you're a developer, understanding how you're positioning yourself to deliver what all the legislators are trying to legislate and then appealing to those legislators is actually a really good strategy. Um, and we'll come back to the major thing is there's loan guarantees, whether it's the European Battery Alliance, whether it's you know coming out of uh, the Infrastructure Acts, whether it's coming out of you know the Australian government, they're lowering the cost of capital deliberately to supply into the energy transition. So you have to understand are you positioned on how to do that? So let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Just, you know, these are some pretty interesting facts. You have to have a carbon game. You must have a carbon game to access capital full stop. Okay, uh, $70 trillion of banks. Every bank you've ever heard of in the Western world is a signatory to the Net Zero Banking Alliance. So if you don't have a carbon plan, you don't, and, and your carbon plan can just say, here's, I've already identified what my carbon plan is. I think I actually know what my scope one, two, and three emissions are. And then I'm going to have a plan on how to get those down. But I, I don't have that figured out yet. But I actually am smart enough to identify it. That's the beginnings of a plan, and you can have a dialogue. If you step into the room and you don't have a plan, you're not going to get very far. That goes on to asset managers, $61 trillion of capital that is looking, that can invest in oil and gas or may or may not invest in oil and gas or invest in LNG, but you know, won't invest in this and that. All of these people, you're competing for their capital and $61 trillion uh, uh, is saying, you know, we have a net zero plan. So you need to be able to position your copper company, your ethical gold company, your nickel company, your cement company, one of Morgan Stanley's top uh, uh, sustainability picks is a cement company, you know, 
So you just need to be able to position yourself to say, this is how I'm helping achieve net zero. And then all of a sudden, you'll find that people will go, oh, a decarbonizing cement company, I love it. You know, I could buy old economy multiples and high cash flow yields and fit it in my ESG bucket. Um, asset owners, uh, you know, influence asset managers, financial service providers. Pretty soon, I don't think you're going to be able to list on a stock exchange without having some sort of carbon disclosure, right? And, uh, and then ultimately, if you want to insure your business or you want to build a business as an explorer or developer and hope that the person that buys your business can get it insured when it's operating, you're going to have to have a net zero plan. So it's absolutely essential that you have a carbon plan. Across all of our investments, we are talking actively with managements or constructing and designing carbon plans to help unlock some of those doors. So this is uh, a difficult slide to read, and I apologize. But what we do is every six or so months, we go out and we kind of look and we say, how's the SG disclosure going? And so the dark green at the bottom, uh, just to help you orient on the left-hand side of the page is uh, companies that are essentially explorers and developers, less than $250 million US market cap and the bars are over time. On the right-hand side of the page are kind of developers, advanced developers and single asset companies. And this is ASX, TSX, New York, London, you know, no China. And, and what the dark green stands for is they publish a, a standalone sustainability report. Light green means that on their front navigation, they actually say sustainability or ESG or community or you know, emissions or carbon or something. And, and they say, hey, we're we're in the game, okay? You know this is important for enough for us to be on the front page. Um, gray is it's somewhere hidden on the site, and red means you don't talk about it at all. And so over time, we go out and we sample, you know, six hundred, four hundred web pages at a time every quarter or every six months, and we and we're seeing how's that going. Okay, by the way, greater than a billion dollars has gone from you know, mid 80s to 98% publish a, a standalone sustainability report. So it's not even worth having a dark green bar. But that just so you know, if you're a billion dollar company or you would like to be, publish a, sustain, uh, you know, a sustainability report. And so what, what I think is interesting about this is that over time, you're seeing increased adoption from the mid tier and you're seeing still pretty weak response from, you know, aspiring companies that are trying to sell rocks rather than sell solutions for a decarbonizing world or an, a world in transition of energy. It doesn't take that much. From experience, we have a company that has no revenue. Uh, uh, we have multiple companies that have no revenue and are publishing sustainability reports. And what they really are in their GRI standard, and yeah, it takes a little bit of time, but then what you find is that the conversations you're having with management the conversations you're having with traditional owners, the conversation you're having with government, and particularly with financial partners, would-be acquirers, uh, would-be customers, suddenly it's very different when you show up and you have that kind of tool in, in your in your toolkit. And so, again, I would just encourage if you want to be a part of the you know of this sort of competition, that's one of the tools that you need, and people are like us are paying attention to that. Finally, there's one other thing that is fascinating. We're doing this in our own companies, but if you're not watching this happen, natural capital value and biodiversity, effectively nature positive mining companies are on the table right now. In the last quarter, both Tech and BHP came out with their own version of how they're gonna be nature positive. And so what that means, is, you know, if you step back, you go nature positive mining company, what that actually means is tech and, and BHP are trying to signal to investors, to lenders, to their you know, government and stakeholders are saying, we're actually going to give back out of all of the profits that we're making here in a way that is tangible and measurable and you can track us. And so that is more than just saying we're reducing our carbon and helping our customers reduce theirs. It's saying we're actually going to take on a whole nother level of obligation around stewardship. So I think that even though these, and there, there may be more, and I'm sorry if your company is a nature positive company and we're, we're you know, not on this slide, but this is something that I think will accelerate um, over the next three to five years. And you're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, triple bottom line accounting rules and things on the SEC that are happening. And, and I think you should expect to see more and more emphasis on nature positive mining companies. So, you know, when you draw it back from our standpoint, 
when we are looking to make uh, liquid investments or concentrated investments, we are thinking about, can we use ESG to drive outcomes, you know, positive outcomes? Can we enroll customers and suppliers and governments and access government funding and grants through how we're positioning the value of our product to society and to their customers? And then uh, we have one company in particular that we're working on that is, you know, the only, it's a coking coal project. And the only way to, for us to get there is to also embrace nature positive. And so we're leaning into that and finding that that's actually, you know, something that's working for us as well. So it's, it's a, uh, you know, when, you, you know, I guess I didn't really talk about the geopolitics in the headline. Um, I'm happy to cover that. We think about that a lot. But in general, what I really see is, it's not something that's going away in terms of ESG. It's a very potent weapon, and uh, and I think you should be thinking about it on an offensive. You know, look at me, attract me to to you know my project, because you're competing against people that are doing that right now. So I'll take questions if there are any. Over there, hi Kingsley Jones, Jervis Global. Excellent talk. Thanks so much for that because. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoy that aspect of your talk about changing our mindset. And so my question really relates, I think, to that nature positive thing, which I think is really interesting. And just to kick off, um, you know, uh, if you look at direct extraction for lithium with ion exchange, obviously there's some teething troubles there, but that would be an example of a technology if more widely applied could be used for environmental cleanup in obvious ways. So just talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing. You mentioned coking coal. I'm not sure what the connection was with nature positive, but but how are you seeing thinking change as to what a mining company actually does, uh, given that it's extractive technology? And sure. The only, not only problems, uh, recycling, other things. Yeah, so I agree with you on direct extraction. And what you'll find is that, it, you know, one of the other things is out there is tailings. I think we'll see a tailings tax in the next five years around tailings intensity, um, just because of what the Church of England and their, and their group of, investors are doing and some of the repeat, you know, accidents. So that's kind of a, a negative causality, negative cost, negative tax burden that's out there. And there may be insurance products that get developed around that. But when you step back, for example, we had, uh, you know, we have a longstanding investment in an exploration project and we locked down um, the a land purchase that had to do with uh, uh you know, bought a lot of land from a timber company, okay? And then we went out and we did all of our permitting data. And actually, everybody around here does cumulative effects around all of their permits, right? So you're collecting local and regional data. And, and what's interesting is that once you have local and regional data, you can actually step back and say, how are these different uh, uh, parts of the biosphere interacting with each other? And so you can you can look and say, how you know, Originally, the question, we came at it from a very uh, blasé, uh, uh, I suppose, approach because we were saying, hey, an acre is not an acre or a hectare is not a hectare. This seems like particularly you know, diverse and interesting hectare, and that seems like a, a wasteland. And so if we get forced into an offset, three to one, five to one, seven to one, I'd like to understand what's the value of this hectare versus that hectare. So we engaged our permit consultant. We handed them all of our permit data. We had, you know, flora, fauna, wildlife, uh, water, all of the rest. And then right now we're coming up with plans on, uh, you know, can we increase wetlands? And what would that do for biodiversity and wildlife corridors? And what kind of system effects does that approve? And we're, we're a couple of years away from somebody saying that's worth $23, you know, but that's coming. Somebody will, somebody will say... The land that surround and and it, and it's it's amazing the uh, the biodiversity of the land can come in some of the most unlikely places you know right next to a refinery or you know a median strip and and so uh, uh, but with your permit data as a project you have access to data that is incredibly powerful for people that are trying to think about. What is the you know the biodiversity angle? What is the nature positive angle? And ultimately, I think what you'll see is you'll see people like Tech and BHP thinking about that when they think about do I want to co-invest or do I want to acquire you? And so you can unlock a tremendous amount of value by using data that you already have in a new way. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions?
most of the world governments are broke at the moment, and um, we're seeing quite a lot of currency volatility. Mm. Um, and uh, certainly interest rates, which had sort of a, a 40-year um, bear market, and bull market for bonds, um, uh, that certainly seems to be over. And so we're going to see um, uh, rising interest rates um, and some of the interest rate burdens that many governments have will look pretty unsustainable. Um, will you still be able to rely on governments to um, provide um, financing um, for a, a lot of these um, ESG issues and the energy transition? It's going to depend. So, th so that's where the interplay with uh, with the with the consumer comes. So if you think about, um, let's go to India. Okay, in India in 2014, if you wanted to build a coal-fired power plant, you had to actually show where you were going to get your coal. Right. Uh, if you wanted to build a gas plant, you had to show where your LNG cargoes were coming from because the government was tired of supporting developers that could build plants. Very easy to build plants, as you know, instead of mines and, and sources of supply. But people were building sources of, of use without sources of supply. And so then to unlock, whether it's government or bank financing, you're having to show the full sweep. And I think we're a hair's breadth away from that, because if you think about all the gigafactories competing mm -hmm. for scarce molecules, it doesn't matter, you know, for, for a period of time, it really won't matter what your um, formulation is, you know, whether it's LFP or, you know, NCM, uh, uh, you know, 511 or 832 or whatever, people are going to be competing for scarce molecules. And so, th you know, there are a number of, say, battery manufacturers and giga gigafactories that will fail to fill. Cap capacity utilization will be low. And that means that the financing Government, usually what happens is, for example, we finance a project with Hermes. The German government provided a loan guarantee, but we actually had to go to, to Credit Agricole to get the loan. So a commercial bank makes a loan and gets a loan guarantee from the German government. That's kind of how it works. So the German government or will, you know, may still underwrite VW's uh, um, you know, retooling of their factory or purchase of XYZ. But uh, ultimately, you're seeing a project finance thought where it, that's going to go all the way down to supply. So it's a very interesting market. In terms of governments going broke, that's part of the reason that we believe that just higher prices forever. And we don't think that austerity works. Other questions? Yeah, so let's come out. Um, this is probably a little bit more, you know, we could share some data offline, but if you think about, uh, for example, go back to the China Steel example. What happened from 2003 to about 2007 is raw steel making capacity expanded incredibly quickly. And the supply demand curve was perfectly balanced. And everybody said, oh, it's in perfect balance. But actually what happened was capacity utilization fell dramatically, right? Because every molecule of coking coal and, and iron ore was absorbed into this capacity. Does that make sense? Okay. And the other thing that happened during that time is for about 25 years, the cost of hot rolled coil, the steel, was about 30% to 35% of that was iron ore and coking coal. And then as p people competed for those molecules to fill their plants that they just built, what happened was the cost of uh, uh, the inputs went to 67% of the cost of steel. And we're in that paradigm right now. It's flush with capacity. Everybody wants to you know, realize their goals. Everybody wants to build capacity there aren't enough molecules and they're all competing. 
And so then eventually, you know, it was really, we, I mean, we were all there, we were all in the industry, but like uh, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, even 13 capacity was coming on, M&A booms, you know, top of the market, all of the rest. And what happened was prices crashed, but then came back in iron ore, for example, and today they still sort of sit at 100, right? So the overcapacity was absorbed. And, but then what's, at, you know, the, what actually, the actually, the ultimate beneficiaries went from being the producers of raw materials ultimately to consumers, you know, and, and the price curves went up. You said earlier that, you know, grades are declining and it's expensive to bring on, bring on new production. Now, I think if you step back and you think about how few people there are to execute to build things right now, we're going to build a lot of things as an industry really sloppily, right? Uh, because there's no other, if we were building it fast, it's just going to be over budget, under plan, you know, and then it's going to work itself out. And so the way that we the way that we think about higher prices forever is in order to create that incentive price to adjust to such wrenching change, you know, by the way, it, it tremendously benefits somebody that is producing today and has a long life to asset. Um, but you're just going to have higher price decks forever. Similarly, cost of energy is up. Cost of labor is up. It's very hard to take a hundred fifty thousand dollar guy and pay him one hundred and twenty. You know, without without serious uh, uh, wrenching change, and so we, you know, the easier thing is you just kind of you're deflating a little bit of that away, and so that's the view on higher prices for you know forever. It seems to me that India is looks like China about two thousand and one, two thousand and two. Um, it just seems to be coming on very very strongly. Um, in the last couple of years, um, that could be a, a really big pressure point for for supply. Um, the, the the additional demand um, could be really quite robust. I would agree. You know, India is interesting because they don't have command over their own energy, so they get thirty percent of their energy from Iran. They get, you know, energy through uh, coal and, you know, um, and LNG seaborne. And so I would expect, though this isn't my particular area of expertise, one of the great things about renewable energy is that it is very deglobalized because you're producing and storing and using your own energy locally. That's some of the push. That's some of why I believe people saw Nord Stream 1 and 2 and Russia and said, actually, we need more, not just from car, you know, from carbon abatement, but also from a self-sufficiency. We just need a more self-sufficient Europe, um, and that's why we need to lean into renewables. We need to do it right now, and so I would expect India to be doing the same from a geopolitical side. Okay, uh, happy to talk offline. Thanks, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>